Welcome to the third recording of episode 391 of Anglican Unscripted. I'm Kevin Coulson. And I'm George Conger. And today is May 4th, 2018. One, three, okay, up front, George and I are not nerdy enough or geeky enough to say, May the Force be with you. That's not us. Or May the Fourth. I don't even know what they say. Yeah. <laughs> Well, that's wrong. That's Vulcan. That's Star Trek. You know, we, we keep, we're not cross-pollinating our sci-fi here. Uh, but you can play Yoda if you want, but uh, that's about it. Uh, George, you have not been on the program for a little while. What's been up in your life? Oh, it's been a busy time here. Our season has just about come to an end. The tourists are going to go home soon, the snowbirds. Last Sunday, we had... Uh, all the clergy and lay leaders and deacons from the deanery come to our church and we had a presentation on dealing with active shooter situations. <sighs> yeah. Now, when I went to seminary, uh, I learned a great deal about heresy. I learned uh, you know, how to be a heretic <laughs> and what to do when a kook showed up in the church. Uh, you know, In the past, if we didn't want someone to come back, we'd enroll them in confirmation class and we'd never see him again. No. Oh. And now we had a lieutenant from the sheriff's department SWAT team come to speak to about 67 people on what to do if an armed if a gunman comes into your church and starts shooting. Uh, Kevin, it's a weird world. So you've had it, active heresy training, but you've not had active sheriff t- uh, shooting training. No, we haven't. Um, now, one of the things I learned is we have, oh, maybe half a dozen uh, current and retired law enforcement officers in our congregation, and half of them carry. I, I, in other words, uh, carry pistols in church. Sure. Uh, and it doesn't particularly bother me if they do or don't, except for Crazy Fred, but that's a different story. Okay. Uh, but, you know, just the whole gun thing has just uh, seized the, the momentum in, in the world today. Sure. Yeah, it, uh, pro I gun, mean, anti gun. Yeah, well, yeah, in Florida, especially. I mean, it's interesting because in Florida, your reaction at the state senate level and, and the uh, was not to ban everything. Here in Connecticut, uh, when it, whenever there's an active shooting, uh, we're going to have common sense gun laws, and that means you can't own a gun, have a gun, think about a gun, or do this with your fingers. Um, in Florida, you didn't you didn't even uh, ban uh, the assault rifles. Well, in Florida, there, there are wheels within wheels. Uh, yeah. In Florida, the uh, the Democratic Party draws upon the African American community mm-hmm. for a major portion of its votes. Florida was the key state in uh, some of the legal court battles in the 1940s. Uh, the U.S. I believe it was the Florida Supreme Court heard a case where essentially blacks were not allowed to own handguns. That's right. And they had restrictive gun registration laws where you had to show training, you had to do all these things were basically designed to prevent African Americans from owning handguns. And the court struck that down saying essentially uh, the rights of all people, uh, including African Americans, are universal to defend themselves. So because, you know, there's just been this unveiling of a lynching memorial. Um, uh, Now where, where minorities have been able to defend themselves that is where you've not had lynchings that's right so the african-american community except for some portions of it in florida is in favor of of, you know, of people being allowed to carry arms because it's part of their heritage is that they protected themselves from okay. the clan with guns for some reason skype doesn't like what you're talking about right now can you plug your microphone in and out again because um you're being censored. Okay, plug it back in. Back in. Okay, good. I think we got it now. All right, yeah. Now, we don't want to make this show about guns, and I don't want to tape again, so even though we had a little glitch, we're going to continue on. George, uh, the big story on Facebook, the Church of England and all the liberals within the Church of England, is Bill Nye, the nobody guy. Well... Here we have the science guy in America. But there's another Bill Nye over there who was asked to do the hardest thing possible, and that's step into the role uh, that's been vacated by uh, Archbishop Justin Welby to be the uh, person who is the enforcer of, or the not the enforcer, but to repeat the policy of what the Church of England is. And I don't know if people remember, but uh, the last general convention in the Episcopal Church, you guys passed trial rights for same-sex marriage 
and part of the thing is we're going to try this bishops can and can't if they want to try these within their own diocese but part of that is we're going to send out letters to all 38 provinces and see what other provinces think and the response was deafening george how many people responded only thir only eight provinces only out of 38 responded eight one of those was and bill nye at, well, Bill Nye, the science guy, uh, on behalf of the church, all the other responses were signed by the primates. Uh -huh. Well, the church, Archbishop Justin Welby, decided not to respond. He shoved this down to the secretary of the Archbishop's Council, essentially a senior bureaucrat in the Church of England. And the senior bureaucrat of the Church of England wrote an eight-page letter uh, basically saying, here's the stance of the Church of England on this issue at this moment, though we are not all of one mind. Okay, hold on. Now, this took well, place back here, in October. We, we need to tell people what the stance of England is, because despite having a liberal evangelical in the office of Archbishop, they actually have a pretty down-the-line uh, response. What is it? Well, it's the, the purposes of marriage are outlined in the Book of Common Prayer, mutual aid and comfort, procreation, and uh -huh. so on and so on and so forth, uh -huh. uh, prophylactic against sin. And until the Book of Common Prayer is changed or upended, or if the doctrine is changed, the Church of England follows what is laid down in its liturgies. And its canon law prevents gay same-sex marriage. Well, Bill Nye repeated this. And this was back in October, and in April of this year, the Standing Committee released the copies of the letters that went out, and liberals in England went bananas. Absolutely bananas. And at the time when this came out, I didn't even cover it. Now, because to me it was so obvious what was being done. The, the Church of England, Justin Welby was burying this. In other words, he had he didn't answer this he had a bureaucrat answer it and he had the ans and the answer in it's such an extended language that you know compared to the archbishop of tanzania said this is wrong don't bother me again that's essentially what he said we've got eight pages of bureaucratic windiness and justin welby six seven months later has yet to mention this has yet to act upon this so it was it, it's a nothing, well, it an is, absolute nothing, but it's an opportunity for the perpetually aggrieved gay lobby in the Church of England to scream, why can't I be loved? It's Well, it is nothing nonsense. because the Episcopal Church really doesn't care what anybody else thinks. Um, it, Rowan Williams certainly didn't stop uh, Bishop uh, Robinson. Uh, there's no way Justin Welby is going to stop uh, same-sex marriage within the walls and diocese of the Episcopal Church. I have been covering international Anglican things since the late 90s, and George Carey and Rowan Williams and the Ang Lambeth Conferences and the uh, Anglican Consultative Conference and primate after primate after primate, primates meetings have all said don't do it. The Episcopal Church doesn't care because it knows there are no consequences for bad acts. So it perfect, makes perfect sense for Justin Welby. I'm not going to get involved in this because if I make a stand, it'll be ignored and my authority will be spurned once more. So shove it down to a bureaucrat who uh, writes in such a way that nobody's going to pay any attention to this. Well, well that's well, the. this was written in October and just became news now because people buried it. Yes, people buried it. and But the thing is that this has become a tiny little issue so that you have very badly informed reporters on blogs and on uh, in the British newspapers saying yeah. Church of England split over American and American Episcopal Church is going to do gay marriage and folks we've already done it yeah. and the Episcopal Church of England is not split rather the gay lobby is reacting with its perpetual predictable outrage well, if I mean, you, these are people who basically walk into a bar and have got a chip on their shoulder and are picking a fight with the neck, you know, with anybody. If you look around the news this last week, LifeSite News, USA Today, Telegraph, Guardian, all said uh, the Episcopal Church in America is going to change their prayer book, taking out man and woman. They were real specific of what was going to happen. Now, you and I have had talks many times about the desire behind the same-sex marriage trial was to just see what happens, but when you change the prayer book, 
you go beyond to see what happens to forcing the bishop's hands. Yeah, and I this is a prediction, uh, but my reading of the situation today is that we're not going to have a changed prayer book. Now, why do I say that? It's not because the crazies and the gay lobby activists have basically pulled back, said, oh, yes, you know, we've got everything we've wanted. But we've reached a compromise three years ago. There have been no more defections. There have been no new lawsuits. The old ones keep chugging along. And Central Florida and Dallas and the successful, wealthy, productive dioceses that have said no to these changes have played ball. We have, in my diocese, we've agreed to raise our assessment of parishes to 12% so we can meet the national church asking. We're playing ball, and the return for that is that we're left alone. A trial right, the bishop can say not using it here. And in Central Florida, you may not, we may not perform gay marriages, we may not allow our churches to be used for gay marriages, and our clergy may not go to other places, other dioceses, other other buildings and perform gay marriage and that's an edict of the bishop yes and also our diocesan convention Mm -hmm. now if you put it in the prayer book the bishop cannot forbid something in the prayer book so the it's the the mechanics are that the house of bishops is still recovering from the shuri era and do they really want to restart the lawsuits do they want to have the threat of schism just to satisfy the perpetually unsatisfied, perpetually aggrieved? Or are they going to leave well enough alone and allow each side to fall or to rise based based upon their own uh, strengths? Well, that's a good question because if Bishop Love, uh, your Bishop Brewer, uh, the Bishop of Dallas, and other moderate to conservative bishops were forced to perform uh, same-sex marriages in their diocese, would they stay? Would this be kind of the final, uh, you know, fracking off for one or two dioceses? No, I don't think I don't think that because the current legal environment mm-hmm. uh, is not favorable to that. But what it actually it would be worse, it would be ignored. Okay. Uh, in other words, yeah, fine, you can tell us we've got to do it, but as soon as somebody does it around here, they would be brought up on charges of conduct on becoming a member of the clergy. So, in other words, we've we've passed the my church has grown 15% a year for the past four years and we're doing even better this year than we've done in the past and if you walked into my church the preaching, the doctrine, the discipline is indistinguishable from uh, we don't have any acne parishes around here in this part of the country but you know we are doing just great thank you very much even with the kooks up north in New Hampshire and Newark <laughs> And and we are, how should I put this? Uh, my parish has gone from, my parish is seven months cash on hand for operations. Everybody could just die and I'll still be paid for seven months. That's good. <laughs> now, does the National Church want us to spend six months cash on hand to hire lawyers to fight things for 10 years? Or do they want to just have us pay our taxes and leave us alone? Uh-huh. That's a good point. Now, you mentioned kooks, which is a great transition to our next two stories. And, you know, we kind of debated which story we're going to do first here. Um, there's the Bishop Cook story. She was uh, uh, the famous drunk uh, bishop. Cook who, story or cook story? Which Cook, cook, who uh, cook. Killed, killed a bicyclist a couple years ago. And there's the Beyonce Mass, uh, which uh, happened over in San Francisco. Uh, George, let's start with Beyonce. Um Every once in a while, some Episcopal clergy somewhere gets a bright idea of how to bring more ute into our church. We need to to reach out to the millennials. And I don't know if you remember this lady, the hip-hop... Catherine Roscom, suffragan bishop of New York. Yeah, hip-hop bishop. And then uh, for a little while, we we were real big into the ute Eucharist. I will follow... You know, uh, where the streets have no name. (laughs) If the videos of of Catherine Roskam in Harlem getting her jig down with (laughs) with hip hop music. uh, Zimmer Dam, Zimmer Dam, yeah. I mean, oh, it was so awful. It was wonderful. And and these pasty faced emo clergy types, uh, you know, uh, 
with their U2 Eucharists and, uh, oh, should we pray or commit suicide? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> now, Kevin, to be fair, if I could come up with a Frank uh, Mass, I, my community would just be over the moon. But, you know, basically, you're right. This is entertainment sneaking into the church because they don't have anything people want to hear anyway. Well, Let's and that's the them. thing. You know, uh, they don't want to even bother using theology, the gospel, the message of Christ, redemption. Um, none of that really is, you know, at their fingertips to use in bringing people into the church. Let's use culture to bring people into the church. And uh, if you two Eucharist didn't... Uh, fill the, the pews um, I can't expect Beyonce will well Beyonce uh, Grace Cathedral in San Francisco which if you're an Episcopalian Grace Cathedral San Francisco sets off the kook alarm yes, bell. Yes. that bell is gone <laughs> wild that this they not they have two labyrinths they're that far out Grace Church uh, has a ministry that uh, works with younger people, which in the Episcopal Church means like you're my age, you know, uh, fifty year olds. <laughs> fifty. It's and, my age too, by the way. <laughs> and they and San Francisco Theological Seminary, which is a far left uh, seminary, uh, had some teachers who came up with this Beyonce Mass, and to basically. Essentially, this is a person of color's version of the U2 Eucharist. Mm -hmm. In other words, they take something that's culturally uh, relevant to one slice of the community and try to Christianize it. On one level, that's a worthy effect. Now, aesthetically, I'm not a Beyonce fan. I'm certainly not a U2 fan. Um, aesthetically, there are problems with that. But, uh, you know, they had a womanist Lord's Prayer which theolo theologically is cuckoo land, uh, if you look at the uh, stories in Anglican Inc. But the thing is, you're absolutely right, Kevin, this is not going to bring in, this will bring in the tourists and the curiosity seekers. But my experience with young people, meaning young people in their 20s, is that they want the unfiltered, pure word of God preached to them. They don't want to be entertained. They've got an iPhone for that. But basically, this was an attempt to use the culture to cram the pews for a dying church. Mm -hmm. And they had a good turnout for the concert, but I don't think we're going to see a lot of converts and change lives and uh, people's hearts being strangely, strangely moved and warmed by the music of Beyonce while they're praying. But she's theological. She's pro-marriage. She has a song called Put a Ring on It. You know, it's not about, you know. Kevin, I am so proud of you. You have a knowledge of our culture that allows you to <laughs> pop out uh, song titles that uh, amazes me. I have three children, two daughters. I, I know put a ring on it. In fact, uh, for the longest time, like two years in a row, uh, my daughter's boyfriend, who was always hinting he would eventually drop the question, uh, but he was slow and a procrastinator, he would get a text from me with a link to Beyonce's song, put a ring on it every Valentine's Day. Finally, he asked my dear uh, Victoria. Subtlety, thou name is Kevin. <laughs> yes, it is. I'm, I'm the worst future father-in-law on the earth, but yep, uh, he finally asked, and my dear uh, Victoria's getting married next June. Yay, finally. All right, so yep, Beyonce can, well, can we make culture Christian? No. Uh, no. Moving on, Bishop Cook. Uh, we have talked about her many times uh, because it's really a black eye for the church in, in many ways. In no way is this conversation about the alcoholic disease that she suffers from. Uh, we pray for and ask that uh, she would be healed of it and uh, certainly get treatment in prison and after prison. But there's rumors coming out that... No, so, uh, Kevin, are you saying love the sin and hate the sinner? I don't know. Or... Or do you want to hate the sin and love the sin? I'm, That's not, right. So, are we going to talk about alcoholism <laughs> and murdering people? Or no. are we going to talk about the it, This is our fifth recording. I just don't want to record again, you know, so I want to keep on online what we're talking about, George. So, Bishop Cook, the rumors are she wants to be released early. 2014, December, around Christmas time, she was gone. She was uh, driving while bombed. She mm -hmm. had been drinking at the church offices. 
was on her way to a church program and was texting on her cell phone when she swerved into a bike lane in North Baltimore and killed a 41-year-old man. She fled the scene. Uh, later returning, uh, an hour or so later, was arrested. Blood alcohol was still over the top at that point. And she was deposed by the Episcopal Church and pled guilty to vehicular manslaughter and drunk driving and leaving the scene of an accident and was sentenced to seven years in prison as a, n- a nonviolent offender. That was in July 2015 she was sentenced. She's been the Maryland Correctional Institute in Jessup all this time. Last year she applied for parole. The parole board turned her down because did not express contrition for the death. Oh, hold on. I, I thought bishop training included contrition training. Fake empathy is yes. part of the, one of the classes at the Episcopal College of Bishops training class. <laughs> That's to be. She probably didn't. She might have. She might have had a hangover. Didn't go to that class that day. But she was turned down for parole. Now, because it was a nonviolent sentence, and she was sentenced to seven years imprisonment, um, with time off, she could get out in July next year. And she's petitioning the court. The Department of Corrections to allow her to spend her final time and under home detention, house detention. And I was alerted to this story by a uh, viewer in the Diocese of Maryland in Baltimore who alerted me to a Facebook posting from the family who was livid that this woman who should stay in jail for years to 2022, they said, is going to get out early and basically be able to stay at home until. T- you know, for the last year of her sentence with an ankle bracelet. Um, this story has not only affected the Episcopal Church, this is a big story in the biking community. Uh, the National Church went on this thing about responding to alcohol abuse and decided, well, it's a bad thing, don't do it. But that's all we basically did. <laughs> yeah, that, that message hasn't changed. I find it interesting. You know, we tease the, the cathedral in uh, San Francisco about having a, a Beyonce uh, mass this thing in Maryland is a black guy that's going to affect the church for generations. There's just yeah. no way to get it beyond what people in Maryland now think of the Episcopal Church. Whenever they see uh, Bishop Cook's, uh, ex-Bishop Cook's, uh, defrocked Bishop's Cook's face in the paper, that's what they think of the Episcopal Church. And well, it's it. It's, the story get, is worse and worse and worse the deeper you get into it. While she was canon to the ordinary in the Diocese of Easton, which is the Eastern Shore of Maryland, she was erected stood for drunk driving. And essentially the diocese, the bishop there, Bishop Shand, covered it up. Mm-hmm. And when she went to the interviews to be Bishop of uh, Maryland, uh, the interviewing committee was told that she had a problem with alcoholism in the past. But she had gotten over it. They weren't told that she had been stopped with uh, an open bottle of booze over the limit with two flat tires and marijuana cigarettes in her car. Mm-hmm. This is a priest, for goodness sake. Uh, but I guess it's Maryland, so maybe they're different up there. I don't know. And then she was elected, and at the party before her consecration, she got public, drunk in public. Mm-hmm. And the bishop of Maryland uh, sort of went to the presiding bishop and said, you know, look at her. Is there something? Is this going to be a problem? And Catherine Jeffrey Shorey said, oh, no, no, no. I am woman, hear me roar. You know, we'll just ignore this. And she was ordained, consecrated bishop, and within a year and a half, uh, she was in jail for murder. Tragic story. And, uh, you know, this is, you know, one of the major reasons we you know, talked about this. Kevin, sem- aren't, oh. Kevin, aren't you, you know, you and I pray before the start of a service yeah. that our, our words encourage and enliven and bring strength to the faith of people. And we've talked about gay marriage, murder, uh, beyond, you know, going, getting old jiggy at a cathedral mass. Uh, what else is there? It's left? your fault. You started off the show doing this. Okay, I can't say that. You know that was not going to lead us down the road to um, unencouraging news. I know, but see, you, you and Gavin start off talking about St. Athanasius or whatever whatever feast it is, and, and we start off talking about Star Trek. And, uh, <laughs> oh, we're different different audience. Segments, it it okay. is a different audience. You know, for me, I mean, it is upsetting to have to report on this. Uh, I was an Episcopalian once, deeply loved the church, deeply loved the liturgy. 
uh, had a great bishop when I was in Alabama at the time, had a wonderful priest, and I thought I would serve out my days in this Episcopalian. Uh, it didn't take too long to figure out that um, that ship was going to sink uh, for people like me. For people like you, the ship is uh, still upright, you got a great bishop, you have a growing church. Um, it's one of those paradoxes uh, uh, that we live in. Um, well, I, the answer I, is very simple, isn't it? Yeah. Move, move to Florida. <laughs> move to Florida. <laughs> Follow your parents, folks, and move to Florida. No income tax. It's better down here. Yeah. <sighs> really? Is no income tax? No income tax. I wrote a whopping check to Connecticut last last two weeks ago. I'm liking that. All right, George. Well, we've ruined the Friday of most people listening to the show. Please like, share, comment, and subscribe. I'm Kevin Carlson. And I'm George Conger, and you've been watching episode 391. <laughs>